Hello and welcome once again to Spider-Man Dissembled. This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston. We're going to be taking a look at Amazing Spider-Man 559 through 561, Peter Parker Paparazzi by Dan Slott and Marcos Martin. So we again have the DB Splash summary page starting us out here. We see Screwball, who is a live streaming online supervillain, which kind of makes me ask if the Superhero Registration Act is so good for the city and has monetary backing, why is this type of stuff still going on? You would think they would be able to like trace the call and find out where her hideout is, etc, etc, etc. I totally agree that due to the Superhero Registration Act, Screwball should have been captured by now, totally. But on the flip side, I actually really like her as a supervillain, a supervillainess, the idea of this totally media whore that's going around filming herself and posting herself on YouTube. I, I mean, I just really think that's a great idea and somebody would totally do it in the Marvel Universe. So I really dig that. I also really like the little banter that she has at the beginning with Spider-Man. A lot of his villains don't tend to, to banter back with them, and the fact that she's kind of doing this right from the beginning and totally throwing him off from his game that way is is pretty fun, I thought. We get a little in-joke here that I enjoyed. Star brand coffee, a little shout-out to the new universe. Very nice. Poor Jim Shooter's crying in a $19 a night hotel somewhere, though. So Screwball, who uses parkour to get around, uh, makes a joke about having the parkour luck, which made me groan, and makes no sense except as an in-joke. So unless she's been reading Spider-Man for the past 20 years. I actually really like the parkour luck joke, partially because, you know, I mean, I, I don't think she needs to be reading Spider-Man to get the in-joke. You know, I can totally imagine somebody kind of coming up with that independently, but like I said, I also think kind of her banter throws him off. That's one reason why he's doing so horrible against her at the beginning here. And it just all kind of plays together. We kind of get to see, you know, some of the Parker luck working against him, some of her, and I'm doing total air quotes right now, parkour luck working against him, and this banter of hers just throwing him off the game. So all in all, I actually really thought this was kind of a fun opening. So Dexter Bennett is not only so hip that he gets photos emailed to him, but he can print them in like minutes. There's a moment where Joe Robertson is thinking about the fact that he has faith in Jonah, that like Jonah's gonna step in and save the bugle one day, and it's really weird. It's framed as if he's thinking of the black struggle. Vin, or as you might know him, cop number one, is looking for a roommate soon. J. Jonah Jameson is learning Tai Chi. I love that when Jameson was fighting off his hallucinogenic Spider-Man Bennett phantoms there, that the cop showed up in like 12 seconds. So not only is Bennett able to get pictures via email and then publish them nigh instantaneously, apparently Vin there and his partner are able to show up at a crime scene nearly instantaneous as well. Maybe there is a cop around when you need one. So here we see Peter put on the celebrity beat because he gets crazy angles. So what does he do for his first assignment? He stands right in the middle of every other paparazzi asshat. Then, of course, he remembers, hey, I'm Spider-Man. So he goes up and uh, does his thing and gets a picture of Bobby Carr slapping a bitch. Bobby Carr is very much modeled after Leonardo DiCaprio here. A little bit of nice continuity here with the nightclub since he's been here back at the first issue and he references it. I believe Slot did end up writing both of them, but it's nice that they actually are keeping their stuff straight so far, at least in that regard. Peter seems super happy to sell out to get some cotton. And everyone thinks he's a douche when he's doing this. Robbie, Harry, May, everyone. It seems really weird that they all hate him for the paparazzi thing. I mean, I'm not a fan of the paparazzi, but it's just really like Aunt May's laying it on, you know, like, what about your degree in science, all your potential? So why wasn't she worried about his potential when he was taking pictures of Spider-Man and potentially putting himself in danger and earning nothing? You know, then, then she wasn't saying anything, but now it's like, oh, you're starting to make yourself some, you know, cash here, but you're a member of the paparazzi. Razzi and Durr, I, I don't, uh, it seems to be laying it on just a little bit too thick with all of these anti-paparazzi friends of his all of a sudden. So I don't, I don't know. I, I'm kind of not buying it very much. The new villain intro here is Paper Doll. She kills for love. We get it revealed that Dexter Bennett is up to something. He set up Carr. There's this forced J. Jonah Jameson, Harry meetup that seriously makes this feel really Smallville. It's like the writers were thinking, how can we pair up two of these contractually obligated main characters? Man, I'm starting to think Slot really has something against Hollywood here and fame. This this opening thing where the woman that car pushed around is all on their version of C Entertainment News or whatever. And she's like, it's traumatizing. And the woman's like, you poor dear. And cut, you know, enjoy your 15 minutes of fame, Miss Harper, while it lasts and like whatever. 
So it's like this, it's really jaded. It's such a weird turnaround. So what kind of started off as this really fun, bouncy storyline with Screwball at the beginning here is just taking kind of a downbeat turn, I guess. It's not depressing. It's just a little bit like, like, really? Oh, this is, this is what it's all like, I guess. Yeah, all right. The bit where Harry's bitching about paparazzi and how they're bloodsuckers and they came after him when he was having drug problems, etc., etc., I think is awesome. I think that's a really good moment. The art makes him look really weird there, though. This thing with Harry kind of going off like this, so far out of everybody that's like, you're paparazzi and grr, Harry's the only one that kind of has a reason for it that makes sense, and I do appreciate that, but on the flip side, they're best friends, and don't you think that perhaps Harry may have mentioned this to him in a non-confrontational manner? It just seems like a little bit, you know, what is he doing here? And I'm gonna kick him out right immediately when he could just be like, Pete, bud, do you realize what they did to me and what happened to me? You know, I'm like, really? I mean, I, I, I understand stand your heart up for cash, but dude, don't you connect it? Don't you get this? And, and so him just kind of flying off the handle with their history together seems a little bit quick to me. Again, a lot of the characterizations for everybody when it comes to this paparazzi deal is just really suddenly fast and hard and angry, like just out of nowhere. So I... It just seems off to me still. I absolutely love that Dexter Bennett has a basket of exotic cheeses ready to go at all times, and Peter eating the exotic cheeses in the background through that whole scene is great. Peter eating that cheese is one of these scenes where this, this art style actually really works. Spidey versus Paper Doll at a pop art gallery with the great line, Ow, giant metal banana, is very reminiscent of one of the early Grant Morrison Batman issues. It might have, in fact, been the first Grant Morrison Batman issue. Yes, that was during Morrison's run of Batman. It was actually the Batman and Son story arc, which was Morrison's first one on his ongoing run, issue 656. It did come out two years before this Amazing Spider-Man issue, so I'm assuming there's really probably no correlation between it, but it is fun to watch Spidey beat up on, uh, well, attempt to beat up on Paper Doll in this environment, so there's a lot of, of fun action sequences that go on during this. I found it weird how their way of reminding us of the Spidey Tracer Killer subplot is just to have people keep calling Spidey that rather than say, having some spider tracer killings go on. Bobby Carr's mystery girl is MJ. And she's reading Faust when we first see her, which is pretty cute. It caught me by surprise when I first read this that it was MJ. So I, I, I want to say that was a good little twist at the end of this. But, uh, you know, maybe it was obvious and I had just totally missed it. Yeah, Faust is totally a nice touch. Joe Robertson quits. He's going to go hang out with Jack, I guess. Right? No, Jack! I miss him so much. And uh, th this brings up the point, I, I think, why haven't we seen a Joe talking with J. Jonah Jameson scene? Like, that seems not just a good idea, but necessary, really. Paper Doll attacks Carr, going after the mystery girl, really, when he's with MJ, and there's a nice little bit of continuity when either Carr or MJ yells, call the initiative! Spidey is actually pretty funny in part three, which is uh, shocking, since so far Zeb Wells has been the only one to write him funny. It says something like, I could play golf in your mansion. Not a full 18 holes, mind you. And then when he hears MJ talking to him through the panic room, he looks up and says, God, is that you? I'm happy that there's actually some funny going on in here. Like I said, I really enjoyed the way it started out with Screwball, and then it just kind of got not funny, and that made me sad. But tee hee hee now. And MJ is in the panic room so that she and Peter don't meet. They are teasing out them ever meeting again, and I have no idea if that's actually even happened by now. Who knows? But they're teasing it out so that this time they kind of sort of meet, but they don't really. The stuff with MJ really makes me wonder about the whole mystery of how much does anybody remember, etc, etc, etc. She really seems to remember everything. There are lots and lots and lots of double entendre in her dialogue. I'm thinking Slot got paid extra each time he had MJ say, in another life. So remember how Crown had a list? Dexter Bennett also has a list, and he knows a lot about Peter. Because Peter is now on the list, obviously. He's on the list because he refuses to expose Carr's mystery girl. Though it's unclear if Peter actually looked at his little card in his camera to know if it was MJ or not. One of the kind of nice things about having Bennett explode there at Peter at the end saying, you know, I know your name, Peter Benjamin Parker, rah, 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 is, you know, it's like we finally kind of see some iron with him. We, we know that Bennett's kind of a jerk. We've seen him be a jerk off and on. And I think it's pretty well established here that his, his running around calling people the wrong name and just his general wackiness is completely an act. I mean, he's known him all along and he knows a lot about him. He's looked into him.
him. So I think you can assume he's done the same thing for everybody in his company, just in case he feels like he needs to put them under his thumb somehow. And and I appreciate the fact that we kind of now have a definite side that Bennett is on. Somewhere in here we get the Spider-Man lawsuit brought up again, and there's a weird point about that that possibly haven't mentioned until now. This guy is suing Spider-Man because of damages that he incurred from Spider-Man and his Spider-Man fight, etc, etc, etc. He's suing him, and the lawyer's whole kind of idea is that, look, we just, we put the lawsuit out there, he's probably never gonna show up, you win the lawsuit, and then if we ever find out who Spider-Man is, you'll be able to get that money from him, and if not, you know, at least it's out there. This must be a really crappy lawyer if everybody remembers that Peter Parker unmasked. Why didn't this lawyer, I mean, okay, I get it, like, supposedly every, uh, Peter unmasked and people know that he's like some kid, but they don't know exactly who he is, but assumedly, you should be able to, like, Google it and look it up if you try really hard. I mean, it should be out there, right? And people would start to wonder if they, like, actually did Google it and then no hits came up, I would think, right? So, it, it, apparently this guy got a really crappy lawyer. Because it's like, why didn't he just Google who Spider-Man was and then put the lawsuit in the name of that person? I mean, I get that, you know, most people just, oh, I don't recognize him, so they kind of forget about it because it's not important to them. But here it's important for these people. And, and I think that that lawsuit is kind of a, I don't know, I hesitate to use this term because they, they do so many kind of little throwbacks to previous continuity with Amazing Spider-Man. But I do think that they consider Brand New Day to be kind of a soft reboot, you know? I mean, they don't want the reader to be thinking about Peter unmasking right now because they, they I think they again, and I, I believe I said this last time, they're just really hoping that if they just don't talk about it, people won't ask. Which, which I get that, I totally get that, but it is frustrating that they're not gonna talk about it, but they keep doing things that make you want to, to ask, why aren't people looking into this more? They're kind of trying to play both sides of the fence with it, and that's a little bit frustrating. You think that they either aren't doing anything for a while until they get ready to kind of explain how this event actually worked, which, you know, we assume we get to when we get to omit, or you just say it right out the gate, you know? We have Spider-Man talking to, like, one of the new Avengers or something, and then being like, look, why don't I remember who you are? And he's like, I did it to save my identity and because of da-da-da-da-da-da. And that way, at least the reader, or if not even during a thought bubble, but at least the reader has an understanding of why it functions like this. So when the lawsuit type thing comes up, the reader can be like, oh, I see, this is why the lawyer didn't think of doing it, is because of this. It's magic. So Vin and Pete move in together. And speaking about some of those throwbacks to some of the older Spider-Man stuff, when Pete's moving into the apartment with Vic, one of the boxes is comp copies of webs kicking us all the way back to like 86 or 87, something along that line. That's, you know, kind of a fun little nice thing that they mentioned there too. I, I enjoyed that. Peter and Harry make up, and we see Jackpot meet Mary Jane and say she's a big fan, thus explaining about half of her origin. We at least see Sarah Errett meet Mary Jane and say that she's a big fan. I don't know if if it's necessarily jackpot, though we would assume so, since she based her look and her mannerisms on Mary Jane. I don't know that anyone who's a fan of Mary Jane as a model and an actress would know that she says tiger in her personal life, but whatever. Actually, when Sarah asks MJ for her autograph, she asks her to write the first line that she said in the first episode, face it, tiger, you've hit the jackpot, to which MJ rep responds that that wasn't in the original script. She just kind of threw it in there. So that does explain where Sarah got the, the tiger and the jackpot line all together from. So even if she doesn't realize something that MJ says daily, she did see. MJ say it. So since we get Mary Jane brought back here, I think this is a fair place to bring up the idea that Jason and I wanted to talk about. The question of, could we be telling these stories with Spider-Man having been married? I'm gonna say no, we couldn't be telling these stories. Not so much because Peter Parker isn't married, necessarily, but simply because Peter Parker is way, way, way more naive and comes across as much younger in these stories. Therefore, most of the subplots could not work. When you're talking about the main stories, like, for instance, the Freak storyline, Aunt May working at Feast, things like that, the bigger problems, I think, are Civil War not being explained away. I mean, like, if, if you're saying, could we be telling these stories if you were married and Civil War not included, then I still think our big, big problem is that the Peter we're reading about now seems like the Peter from about 1984. Four at the latest, I would guess. Actually, I don't know when he got married. So let's say three years before he got married in our time. So if he's incredibly naive now and he's a different character, I think he would be handling almost every situation differently. Could these stories be told with Peter and MJ still married? Obviously, the main plots, absolutely. There's very little that would need to be tweaked to make those work. A lot of the subplots 
I, I'm willing to say a lot of the subplots you still could have with them being married, and most of them you could still make work, with just little subtle tweaks here and there. I'm almost even willing to still say right now a lot of those subplots would be still just as interesting with MJ and Peter still married. Like, things like when, when it looked like Lily was hitting on Peter, you could still totally do that. Peter's reaction would be more or less still the same, since it seems right now that Lily is willing to cheat on Harry for Peter, which we don't know. I mean, that's just, you know, the way that that one scene looked like it played out. If she's willing to do that to her boyfriend, she's more than willing to do that with a married man, so that wouldn't really need to change. Some of the stuff with Carly would obviously, you know, need to change, but then again, it's not like they've really been flirting. And a lot of the stuff that's been dealing with Peter's personal romantic life has been kind of lame anyway, so I, I really don't think there's a big loss to just have jettisoned most of it. It would obviously be difficult to be telling a lot of these subplot storylines simply because, for instance, Peter was so worried about money, well, MJ's rich. I guess you could pretty easily say bankrupt MJ because of those Civil War storylines, something like that. You could bankrupt her. You know, they, I don't know, uh, uh, she's a wanted criminal so she can't access her money. I think they were doing that a little bit at the end of JMS's run. I don't really remember it at this point, and and I've tried to block it out. But I, you could probably do something like that where they don't have money, and so it is a struggle for Peter to afford his web shooters, afford things like that. But those also don't necessarily seem to fit with the Peter of the last 20 years. Michael does bring up a valid point that we actually are seeing, irritatingly enough, we are seeing a younger, more naive, more green Spider-Man, Peter Parker even. You know, I mean, he's making a lot of really dumb rookie mistakes that he wouldn't have been making later on in his career. But, I, I don't know, I actually put the responsibility on that on weak writing on their part. It frustrates me that we have a veteran superhero like Spidey making the mistakes that he's been making. They need to decide, is he a veteran, and if so, with or without MJ, he should be handling these things better than he is, or is he a rookie, in which case we've done a soft reset, we should just say that out the door and get past it and continue on, soldier our way through, and they haven't done either. They've been trying to play both sides. And, and for me, I've liked the A plots for a lot of them, I have not liked. I'm lukewarm towards a lot of the subplots because I feel like a lot of the subplots make, you know, is that contradiction between him being a veteran and him being a rookie and, and that frustrates me. And like I said, the romantic subplots for the most part I find just, they're not, I just really don't think A, much has been done with his romantic life, which if you're going to have him, you know, no longer be married, that is something they should be playing with. And B, what little bit they have done with that has just not been that entertaining to me. Um, um, some of the other subplots that they've been doing that I've really enjoyed aren't necessarily tied to his, you know, Spider-Man at all at this point, like, for instance, the mayoral race or the Daily Bugle being sold. You know, you could have Peter and MJ married and those things could still happen. You could have Peter and Captain America married and those things would still be happening. So, though, you know, could still happen and they're not contingent upon his marriage at all. But let me phrase it this way. I don't think there's been any entertaining thing to me that has happened so far during this series that the brand new day stuff that could not have been done with Peter and MJ married. With obviously the exception of this story arc that we have just gone through since, you know, in order for this entire story to kind of, well, well, you know, in order for the mystery woman to be MJ at least, you know, they couldn't be married. Although I suppose that put a very interesting twist on the relationship if she still was the mystery woman. And, and even in that case, you could still have the hard up for cash, him playing with the paparazzi angle. Everybody hates him, including now MJ, because MJ totally knows what it's like to be a paparazzi. So he'd have to be like hiding it from her if he wanted to, you know, plan on doing it and there's an even more hard up seeing how sad he is to get money to support her angle you know or he would just never do it to begin with because of MJ which is more than likely what would actually happen unless we're going for the kind of stupid rookie Peter like they've been playing him as. So my opinion is still yes any part of Spider-Man that I have personally enjoyed with the brand new day stuff could just as easily have been done with Peter and MJ married. And then of course Peter wouldn't be say rooming with Vin if he's married. I mean that would be well, I guess he could, you know, I mean, uh, he and MJ could need a roommate, but he probably wouldn't be rooming with him, not because he's married, but because he's a police officer and Peter's a wanted felon at that point. Which, the fact that he's even risking that at all, if he remembers things, seems unlikely. So at this point, it's weird, at this point, a lot of what we're seeing kind of implies that Peter doesn't remember anything, but MJ does. And even if Peter does, you know, remember the deal with Mephisto, which which I, I think he does at this point, even if he doesn't, though, it still seems to be kind of a stupid move on his part to be right now moving in with...
with a cop when he is wanted for murder. And even even if he wasn't, it still seems to be kind of a stupid move in general. He's he's a costume masked vigilante during the registration act. You know, it just seems to be a kind of a dumb move all the way around for him. But you know, Peter hasn't really been the smartest guy since one more day. Even ignoring One More Day, they've still done a lot of things to make Peter Parker an unlikable character right now. And I think having MJ in the mix actually would have kind of swung that another direction. Having somebody that he could talk to and confide in and talk about some of his money problems would have been helpful. So yeah, overall, I don't think we could tell these stories if Spidey was still married. Because of those very basic reasons. Not because you couldn't have him married and be telling the kind of main plots of the storylines that we're having each month, but simply because the subplots wouldn't work. And at this point, the subplots are far more interesting than any of the main plots. I don't think any of the main plots that have happened have really meant a damn to me. Um trying to recall, uh, yeah. The only one that seemed slightly important was the Magia one, and that hasn't gone anywhere. As you probably guessed from a couple of my comments, I didn't really care for the art in this three-parter. All right, so for me, yeah, the art was really kind of hit and miss. I kind of got where they were going with it. It's MJ's first real appearance in Brand New Day. I think they were trying to go and harken back to a kind of more retro feel for when she first showed up, and so they chose an artist that did that. Also, the reason why they were kind of in the pop art museum was all kind of uh, homage, I suppose, to that. And so it was kind of hit and miss to me. A lot of the uh, Spider-Man stuff, I, I wasn't really a fan of them with, but kind of a lot of the more stylized things from the artist I liked. It's kind of weird. I'm not usually like that. I usually don't like stylized things as much as normal, but the artistic skill was not inconsistent, but his style I don't feel worked in every single piece of the story. But it, I didn't feel like it massively detracted from it either. I wasn't, I wasn't really annoyed by it. But I will say this about Dan Slott, the writer. It feels like Slott's stuff, to me, is the real Spider-Man stuff. Everything else feels, like for instance, if these were separate titles, it feels like Dan Slott would be writing Amazing Spider-Man. Zeb Wells would be writing Friendly Neighborhood or Sensational, like, you know, kind of a, a second-rate one, but still kind of coming out monthly and, you know, kind of one of the bigger ones. Bob Gale and Mark Guggenheim might, for instance, say, be working on a quarterly or a bi-monthly series, something like that. I also totally agree that it feels like Slot has kind of taken the lead of the uh, Spidey brain trust here. Like, he does seem to be telling the stuff that, that seems like it is the most important to the reforging of the new Spider-Man mythos, however you guys, you know, however you want to say it. And while it does feel like he's taken Point Man for that, I feel that Zeb Wells, honestly, has more of the heart of Spider-Man. He actually, like, understands a bit better, at least from the, what we've seen, but he understands a bit better on how to tell a good Spider-Man story and, you know, actually make it funny and actually do interesting things with him where it's like Slot seems to be kind of like forced to deal with kind of like bigger moments that that just don't seem to be quite as interesting. Like like compared to the last story arc, that totally gonzo off the wall blizzard one, I enjoyed that three times more than I enjoyed this one, but this one is technically more important to the meta plot, but it just wasn't as fun. It wasn't as entertaining to me. That's really all I have to say on the topic and all I have to say on everything overall. So for now, this is Michael D. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston. Thank you for listening to Spider-Man Dissemble.